Hi, and welcome to the December episode of Spotlight on UNBC. My name is Rob Van Adercombe. Coming up on the show this month, we'll have some basketball highlights. We'll travel to Vail Mount and Williams Lake for a couple of unique course offerings, and we'll check in on some high-tech UNBC research. But next, we'll find out how UNBC did in its first ever attempt at the McLean's University Rankings issue. All that and more is coming up on this episode of Spotlight on UNBC for December 1998. For a new university like UNBC, national media coverage is a big deal. And so it was when UNBC was ranked number nine in the annual ranking of Canadian universities by Maclean's magazine. We're a new upstart university and we're in the upper half of the class. I mean, uh, and they're all very good institutions. I mean, the trouble with the Maclean's rankings is that, uh, you know, it gives you a sense that maybe some of the universities aren't very good, but that's not true in Canada. They're all very, very good universities. So to be in the upper half of a very good class of universities is exceptional. The first ever ranking for UNBC generated a lot of enthusiasm on campus as students checked out how UNBC fared against other universities. What they found was a high rating for the quality of UNBC faculty and their incredible success for attracting nationally funded research. In fact, UNBC ranked number one for research in the social sciences and humanities. The university started off with graduate programs. Well, you don't have graduate programs without highly qualified faculty who are actively involved in research. So all of those things fit together and they fit the profile of UNBC with, with exceptional faculty members uh, actively engaged in research, being very, very competitive in their ability to get research grants. I mean, that, but I would say that that was intentional right from the beginning and our hiring reflected uh, the attitude of what people wanted in a northern university. Also highly ranked was the library, which placed number one for new acquisitions and number six for the number of holdings per student. I experienced the library is roughly doubling itself now um, very quickly in about two years uh, since it started. And um, that's a good thing in the sense that we are adding more material and I can see the growth and use of the collection is phenomenal. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen students use the material so much. Uh, the turnaround time, turn, the amount of percentage of the collection is about 40 percent which is very high and students are in here all the time. Of course students are using more than just books. These days they have an incredible access to materials through the computer. In terms of electronic databases, we're about 70 databases we have access to ourselves or we have a consortial purchase of, which is a, is a very high number of electronic uh, resources. And that will increase. Our strategy is to increase that as much as possible because it's f access to full text, which we don't have, mm -hmm. so we don't have the huge space problems or storage problems of other institutions. And also because we can serve the regions uh, in northern British Columbia a lot better uh, because they, they find it difficult, obviously, to get stuff by mail or by courier, and they can do that electronically from home, and we've just started to introduce that kind of service. There's one database we have access to for students here, Lexis, which is online, which has access to virtually full text of about, must be close to 10,000 publications easily. We'll never be top of the primarily undergraduate because that's not our ambition. Our ambition is to be a, more of a comprehensive university with a broad range of undergraduate and graduate programs and a heavy emphasis on research. And, uh, and, and that's what we intend to be. And we hope we do well in McLean's, but McLean's isn't going to de determine policy at, at UMBC. McLean's Magazine rated UNBC one of the top three small research universities in the country, and much of the research here has direct relevance for Northern BC. UNBC graduate student Christine Breed recently completed a high-tech analysis of air pollution using UNBC's electron microscope. 
if I looked at particulate matter less than 10 mic microns in diameter. Now, to get an idea of the size range I was looking at for my study, consider the, the fact that um, basically the size I was looking at was like one one hundredth of the size of a human hair. Okay? So if you picture that, that's how the, the size range I was looking at. Christine's research was the most detailed analysis of air pollution ever conducted in Canada. Her goal was to find out the size, shape, and chemical composition of the particles in the air, as well as where they came from. Spherical shaped particulates, or perfect spheres, are generally found from anthropogenic or combustion sources. Now, what I found for in the Prince George airshed was most of the particles looked something like they were amorphous. They looked like a rock, basically. Most of them looked rock-shaped, and that was because the road dust was such a contributor. The dirt that we spray on our roads in the winter is a major culprit, but so is industry, and beehive burners are a high-profile example of a combustion source. The research has confirmed what Ministry of Environment officials have suspected. Yeah, in terms of, A, knowing that, yes, these are real sources that are, that are part of our problem, you know, and also being able to um, uh, identify other sources, perhaps things that we didn't know uh, were so significant, um, and also relate it to, uh, you know, what, what's going on in particular in town, like what happens during street cleaning, you know, just how much dust is distributed during street cleaning versus other things, so that you can start to use that information to uh, design uh, ways of reducing it, you know. What I would do is I would pick a particle, say this particle right here, and I'd be looking at how large this particle was. And I was basically, I would use the ruler of I would go and measure it. Then what I would do was I would increase the beam and I would spot check and I would, I would say, basically I'm asking the machine, what is the chemical analysis of that particle? This particle actually has a lot of carbon and some oxygen. Now, the fluorine was from the filter, so there was some sodium, some aluminum, and some silicon. I guess my first reaction was, isn't this interesting? Because what Christine has done is demonstrate very clearly that the episodes um, do have a predominance of road dust in them, whether or not people like to like to acknowledge that. We, we have suspected that and, and now we've got um, proof positive. But the flip side of that is that the non-episodes or times when the particulate levels may not be over 50 are more likely to be um, man-made particles of combustion and those are the ones that are more likely causing the lung disease and the excess of, of lung and heart deaths that we know are associated with air pollution. In fact, the research has illustrated the need for a greater understanding of the link between health and air quality. We know that we've got one of the highest levels of death from chronic respiratory disease, one of the highest levels of death from pneumonia and influenza, which is another process. And um, we know also that, that we have a, a higher underlying level of illness generally here. We know that we have a lot of smokers here. And we know that we've got a problem with air quality here. How we separate those out is, is not an easy task. The electron microscope used in that air pollution study was acquired in part by a contribution from Alcan. The Bank of Montreal, meanwhile, has given UNVC the money to acquire a state-of-the-art DNA facility. That equipment is being used by UNVC researchers to assess the precise genetic code of organisms, and the information is being applied to research in forestry and fisheries. The potential for doing forensic types work in wildlife and fisheries is there, as well as other higher, higher level biotechnology applications. The potential is there because a $50,000 contribution from the Bank of Montreal allowed UNBC to acquire the state-of-the-art DNA facility. Graduate student Joanne Kelly explains how it works. I'm taking this glass plate, which has uh, a media in it, which we call a polyacrylamide gel. But it's basically, it's like jello, and uh, we're preparing it so that when we put DNA into it, into the, into the wells, that uh, it's a form or a media for the DNA to actually run through so we can visualize it on the computer. 
So I'm just lining up the plate with the lasers on the bottom of this uh, machine called the clipper so that when the DNA runs through, the lasers will actually pick up the fragments that are coming through and it'll transfer the information to the computer. What you're seeing here is, is a completed sequence that has been uh, analyzed from the clipper. And what you're seeing is the different bases which make up the genetic code of DNA. So each, each peak represents a certain base and they're also color coded so that it makes it easy for us to distinguish what bases are there. What we'll do with this is we'll take this sequence and we'll align it and compare it to another sequence of another um, individual fish or another organism to see if there's any changes. A lot of my research is fisheries based and the types of things we're doing as, as Joanne pointed out is looking at rainbow versus steelhead trout. Uh, they look very different, people uh, fish for them very differently. However, there's a question of how genetically related they are. Are they the same species and they just look different or are they totally different species? And we're looking at their genes, their DNA to determine whether or not they're a different species or whether they're the same species. We're also using this DNA sequencing equipment to determine whether or not we have uh, salmon populations that can be used for fish farming. Mm -hmm. Because in fish farms you have a set of requirements that are very different for wild salmon. They have to be able to resist disease, they have to be able to grow very quickly. And we're looking at the genes that are related to that and being able to tell the fish farmers that these fish are good for fish farming as opposed to these fish aren't as good genetically speaking. There are also some very interesting forestry applications. We can actually start genetically designing trees so that they're resistant to specific pests. We could genetically design trees to grow fast, to produce high or low density um, fiber, depending upon what you need. These are all possibilities, and, and the sequencing equipment that, that the Bank of Montreal has made possible for UNBC opens the door for that kind of biotechnology for researchers here. A new Canadian research agency seems ideally suited to the kind of research that's conducted at UNBC. The new agency is a combination of the Canadian Forest Service and the two national research councils that fund research in the natural sciences and humanities. The purpose is to support forestry research that includes both the social and environmental perspectives. I don't think this concept is that radical based on the philosophy of this university. What would I see as a success? Um, to see those types of projects um, where you really tie together uh, the science and the, the social science into joint efforts uh, where you have an output that serves uh, the needs of the forest sector and the community as a whole. And those two are obviously very closely linked in this, uh, in this area. The former head of the U.S. Forest Service visited UNBC at the end of last month when he was the featured speaker in the annual Doug Little Memorial Lecture Series. Jack Ward Thomas was at the center of the famous Spotted Owl debate, and he advocates a progressive approach to forestry that includes public involvement and conservation. We can't expect one profession to know how to do it all. Foresters, for example, are going to need uh, help from wildlife biologists, soil scientists, social scientists, economists and others to, uh, to do the appropriate job. So basically we have to give up on the myth of the omniscient forester and begin to deal with uh, teamwork and how we do that management. They tell, told me when I was an undergraduate 40 some odd years ago that this job was 10% uh, technical and 90% people. Then they turned around and gave me 90% technical training and 10% about how to deal with people. Economic questions, social questions. And uh, so now uh, I think we're going to have to have a little bit more training in that regard. Two important international delegations visited UNBC recently to establish some northern links. The first was a group of Russian university presidents who were followed by a Nordic mission from Scandinavian countries. These are rectors or vice rectors from various universities across uh, parts of Siberia, from Tomsk, uh, Ekaterinburg, and Vladivostok. They're here uh, pursuing um, strengthening ties with Canadian universities and 
because of uh, UNBC's um, experience and expertise in the field of Russia, particularly Russian, Russia's north and Siberia. There's uh, some interest here in pursuing uh, academic uh, contacts, exchange of students, faculty exchanges, and cooperation in terms of helping them develop their curricula. A few days later, about a dozen reps of northern European universities came to UNBC with a very similar goal. The Nordic Mission was on a two-week cross-Canada tour that was organized in part by the Canadian Embassy in Oslo, Norway. I know myself, I was a, a student at Carleton in, in Ottawa for four years, and you sort of bring that with you, and you keep it with you, and it's, it's, it's a kind of a loyalty to that country you've been to that sort of is, is, is very useful. And that's also very useful for uh, an embassy or a, a Canadian company operating in, in, let's say, a Nordic country and, and finding people that know about Canada and, 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 and are interested in it and have some special ties, absolutely. So, there are regions in the world, and, and obviously countries can have different focuses. Uh, you know, Canada can look south, it can look east, it can look west, and it can look north. And, and, and I think it is quite a new trend, uh, the circumpolar one, I think, and it's one that I think is going to grow. There have also been a number of visits from politicians recently, including the B.C. wing of the Federal Liberal Caucus and both the provincial and federal ministers of Aboriginal Affairs. Treaties are designed to provide... Provincial Aboriginal Affairs so Minister know. Dale Lovick spoke to a first-year history class about the Nishka Agreement. So I'll talk a little bit about why we're doing this thing, and I generally break, break that down into three principal reasons. I talk about justice issues or morality, if you prefer. I talk about the legal dimension, and I talk about the financial dimension. And each of those, individually and collectively, leads one to one inescapable conclusion, namely that we had better negotiate land claims in this province, and moreover, we had better accept this deal because this is indeed as good as it's likely to get, and if we don't do NISCA, the obvious question is, what do we do then? Federal Minister Jane Stewart spoke to the same class a few weeks later about the NISCA treaty in particular, but also about the federal government's plan to sign treaties generally and institute self-government. Through the British Columbia Treaty Commission, we are engaged at 51 different tables, tables that cover about 71% of the First Nations in British Columbia, focusing on identifying the rights that exist for individual First Nations, clarifying them and exhaustively setting them out in a treaty, um, and, and creating, creating that agreement, that legal obligation that we feel will fulfill our um, requirements under the Constitution to reflect Aboriginal rights. During her visit to UNBC, Jane Stewart also visited with students at the First Nations Centre. She was only the most recent government MP to visit UNBC. A few weeks earlier, the BC members of the Federal Liberal Caucus held a meeting at the university. The Hong Kong Bank of Canada recently announced its support of UNBC's unique Northern Advancement Program, which is a transition program for rural and First Nations students who are now attending university. Hong Kong Bank President and CEO Yusuf Nasser participated in a ceremony to acknowledge the bank's $150,000 contribution. We're very pleased to donate the $150,000, uh, but let me remind you, it is UNBC, not Hong Kong Bank of Canada, which deserves the recognition for establishing this fine program. To help meet the special needs of these rural students, many of whom live in First Nation communities, UNBC has established a Northern Advancement Program to assist and support First Nation students so that they can make a successful transition to university. It's a program that's been very resourceful and helpful for myself as I'm a native from a very small rural area outside of a city and having to be introduced into a university and being accommodated to um, be comfortable and being able to learn and experience the knowledge that is here and available to us has been very helpful to me and my fellow students as well. 
While at the university, Mr. Nasser also spoke to a group of business students about issues in international business. Graduates of UNBC from the Northern Advancement Program will be attractive candidates for hiring by governments, non-profit organizations, corporations, and of course, Hong Kong Bank of Canada. UNBC's worldwide website is heavily used by prospective students to find out more information about UNBC, but a new high-tech information source is now available. The university has produced a CD-ROM with information about degree programs, services, and Northern BC generally. The CD is being distributed throughout North America and will give students the opportunity to get relevant information about the universities that interest them. While the majority of UNBC students take courses at the Prince George campus, there are about 65 courses available in about a dozen northern BC communities. Those offerings include the first ever university course in the Robson Valley and a Williams Lake program called the Weekend University. We know what's best. UNBC and the University College of the Caribou have a fantastic program going where it's called Weekend University. And students from the Caribou Tribal Council come every second weekend where they take one course on Friday from the University College of the Caribou and one from UNBC. And together over a number of years we'll able eventually to complete a university degree. Eighteen students are registered in the program this semester and many travel two or three hours to attend classes. Many of them also have jobs and families, so the format of having classes every second weekend gives them the chance to earn credits towards getting a degree. Rather than taking time off, taking, um, just quitting my job and going to school here, I still keep the job and continue to, um, what am I saying, continue to take these courses here. It is sometimes a challenge to get the homework done <laughs> and continue working because I, right now it's a busy time of the year and I'm, I'm juggling my schedule quite a bit to get my homework done. I'm from Canham Lake and I'm in it because I want to get my degree. Lindsay Boyce previously attended the University College of the Caribou in Kamloops. She's now pursuing a degree in political science. I was in full time but now I, I have two children and I'm the sole earner of our family and, and being a full time student wasn't really working out for me because of like I couldn't provide like extracurricular things for my children, so so this part time works good. Plus, I already I started out with 27 credits, so I'm already a quarter of the ways there. My experiences in northern Alberta and, and here in northern British Columbia have been quite similar. There's a lot of uh, students from rural and First Nations communities that typically don't go to university in the larger centers, but they do access university courses when they're offered regionally. And when they do that, the success rate is much higher. And often after a couple of years or a three-year program, they tend to go on and, and finish off degrees later on. But the, the huge uh, value is that you're bringing in tools and skills into communities that those communities wouldn't get otherwise. The band seems like they're investing in us. Like they send us to this course, they're investing in us. And for the future, then we will be able to pay the band back with our knowledge that we've acquired through these two courses here. Sometimes investments in the future can also pay dividends today. So it is in Vailmount, where the first ever university course in the Robson Valley is currently underway. Professor Roger Beck retired to Vailmount and is now teaching UNBC courses after nearly 25 years at the University of Alberta. What happened this year was that I, I heard about a visit from the president of UNBC to Vailmount and the, the fact that there was an interest on the part of UNBC in serving people in Vailmount and I was encouraged as a result of making some inquiries to submit my resume and, and explain what courses I might be able to teach so I did that and as a result I was invited to teach this introduction to business course. Actually, the reasons that they started or we started the, the course are different to the reasons now why we're still at it. It has changed, like 
at the beginning it was maybe somebody wanted to pursue a business career, but now it's more the personal challenge of learning. Bernadette Frankie is one of six students in the course. She travels from McBride every week to attend classes. We do have a small business, that was the first reason to come. And then I wanted to see, you know, just after raising kids, getting back into learning and see how whether I'm capable. And the other reason was uh, it was offered for the community and I wanted to make sure it will happen in the future. Courses like this will be offered and I thought if many people go for the first course, then uh, there's more of a chance to have this offered in the future. I expected that this would be good that they would learn and that it would be fun, but it has well exceeded my expectations. They have really done very well. The UNBC Northern Timberwolves men's and women's basketball teams have been traveling all over BC and Alberta this semester for a series of exhibition games against other collegiate teams. The two teams were in Prince George recently for some rare games at home. We started off the season in Grand Prairie October 3rd. We played two games there. Um, we split with them. We came back home, immediately went down to Vancouver to play three. Came back home, went to Edmonton to play three. Back home, we played a couple home games and then we went back to Vancouver again. So basically in the last two months we've been, we've had one home game and every other weekend's been on the road. We wanted to win four college games, then we came out in the first three weekends and we won three. So um, now we're looking for that fourth win. That fourth win wouldn't come this weekend as the women's team dropped both games against Malaspina and Camosun College, but the team has a number of first year players who will make an impact in the future. I want to be a, a better player just overall and I want to uh, not just on the floor, but off the floor. So, um, just, I, I want to be able to shoot the ball <laughs> better and to be able to, uh, just be able to direct traffic on the floor and, and be a leader. The guys fared a lot better than the women this weekend as they earned a split against the Prince George All-Star team. Like the women, they've also been on the road a lot this season. It's a good time, it's lots of fun. Uh, you don't, uh, you gotta study a lot on the road though in order for you to keep up your grades and so you can play basketball. But the road trips are long, but it's lots of fun playing. You learn a lot about teamwork. Yeah, a couple wins would be really nice. Uh, maybe we just want to play like a team, basically. At the end of the season, we just want to be a good team, play like a good team, and show that we're established up here in Prince George. until May. So what we have to do is we have a bunch of criteria that we have to meet between now and May. We'll get the go-ahead or the rejection in May and from there we have to build, rebuild our program again. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to build a program based on the assumption that we will be in the league but it's, I mean, you still have to be upfront with the athletes saying, you know, we don't know till May but you're recruiting, hoping that we will be. And with the girls that I have, I'll have only one graduating player which is a big step. Thanks for watching this episode of Spotlight on UNBC. On behalf of everyone at the university, season's greetings and good luck in 1999.